I'm Sarah. Thanks for joining us for our rainforest program today. We're going to be talking a little bit about the rainforest and the animals that live there. So one of the things that's really unique about the rainforest is the incredible amount of biodiversity within the rainforest. So there are a lot of animals that live in the rainforest. And the rainforest isn't just in South America. There are rainforests all over the world. So there's a really large variety of animals that depend on life um, within the rainforest. So um, they need all of the water that um, accumulates in the rainforest because of the amount of rainfall. They need the different layers within the rainforest um, for proper housing, and they need the food in the rainforest. So it's really, really important um, for these animals to be able to live in their natural habitat. Um, so that's a lot of the things that you'll find within the rainforest, and we're going to talk about the animals that live in those layers. So first we're going to go to Christina. Christina's going to talk about the forest floor. Next we're going to talk about the understory with Jared. And finally, we're gonna to go to the emergence layer and we're gonna talk with Keisha there. Hi everybody, today we have our giant African millipede here. These guys can be found on forest floors in Africa with a lot of other creatures too, just like some snakes, uh, we have some gorillas, all these different animals found in the forest can be found there with him. There's a lot of these millipedes that can be found on the forest floor because they are what are known as decomposers. So they are really important for that forest floor and keeping it healthy. Because these guys, what they like to eat is they like to eat those types of food that are kind of little uh, rotten leaves that fall down to the ground, things that are just kind of laying on the ground and keeping it nice and dirty. These guys are kind of like the forest janitor because they'll eat food on the floor and they'll keep it clean, which is really important. Because if you think about it, when it comes to forest, plants are very essential for making a forest a forest. So if you have the ground covered in a bunch of different leaves, a bunch of debris, and there's no way for light to get into that, or to get to those new plants growing, then they're not going to be able to grow and be healthy plants. So since these guys help keep that forest floor clean by eating all of that stuff found on the ground, they actually help new plants grow because then sunlight can get to the forest floor bottom where they can get a healthy sun and getting it so they can grow and be tall, happy little plants. So these guys though are not actually an insect. A lot of people look at this millipede and they're gonna think in their head, that's a really big bug. Well, he is a big bug, but he's not an insect because insects can be told apart because they have three body segments and then they have six legs. As you see, he has a little bit more than six legs. Uh, he has anywhere from about three to 400 legs when he's fully grown. That is a lot of legs. A lot of people like to guess when I ask them in person how many they think he has. They're gonna be like million or a thousand because milla means a thousand. And he doesn't have that many, but you can tell how many legs he does have if you were bored one day and you know, wanted to sit down and count all of his legs uh, because he has four or two pairs of legs per little body segment. So if you sit down and you count all those little body segments, you can figure out how many legs he has exactly, but we don't have that kind of time in our day, so we don't do that. <laughs> um, but this guy is pretty cool, like I mentioned. He can be found in Africa as well as places like Madagascar. One of the unique things about uh, the millipedes found in Madagascar is the fact that lemurs over there actually like to interact with them. So lemurs will pick up these guys and they will bang them on trees, annoy the living daylights out of them until they release a special substance that they have in their legs. And the, the lemurs will take that substance and actually put it all over their body, rub it all over. And there's a purpose for that. They actually use these guys as a form of bug spray because that yellow substance that these guys can release from their legs is a toxin so it smells really bad it can make animals sick if they uh, ingest it or eat it because they have stressed these guys out but the lemurs have found a use for it in a bug spray so it works pretty well for them uh, like i mentioned though that is a form of self-defense for these guys because they are really big bugs and so a lot of animals will look at them and think that looks like a tasty little treat uh, most of the time animals don't want to be tasty little treats so they need to take care of themselves so he'll release that liquid if he feels stressed out um, and that is one way to protect him the other way is his exoskeleton so if you look at his back he has a really really hard exoskeleton which keeps him protected so you know how we have our soft skin on the outside and our skeleton and bones on the inside these guys are a little bit reversed. They have their soft, squishy stuff on the inside and then that hard exoskeleton on the outside, which keeps them protected. So that's one of the ways that they can take care of themselves in the wild. Another thing that they can do is since they are a decomposer, since they are found on the forest floor, they're very good at hiding. You don't typically find these guys very often because that dark color will also camouflage them and keep them safe that way. You can find them in uh, debris such as leaves underneath bushes all these different things and that will keep them 
protect, or, and that will keep them safe as well because they're camouflaged as well as using that exoskeleton and then that toxin to keep themselves safe in the wild. So if you can see him as he's walking, he, with all of his little legs, there's a lot of uh, chance, in my opinion, he, I would trip a lot if I had more than two legs. I already trip on two legs. So how he can walk with so many legs is quite unique. If you look, he kind of moves his legs in a wave. So then he has a very slow walk, but it's a very uh, consistent walk. So he has this pace, and this is about as fast as he's going to go, but he doesn't trip. He's able to move really well. You can see he's gripping onto me pretty easily, no matter where he's going. And then if you look at his little front, he has those antennas. These guys can't see very well because they have very, very small eyes, which don't do much for them. So they use those antennas kind of as feelers to figure out where they want to go. And so that, that's how he hasn't been able to fall off my hand because he's making sure that there's somewhere for him to go before he keeps walking. Now that we've learned some cool stuff about the forest floor, we're gonna move our way up in the forest to the next layer. All right, here we have Leo. Leo is a prehensile-tailed porcupine. And with Leo is Kaylee. She is a zookeeper who takes care of him and does a lot of training with him. Um, so Leo is an animal that you would find in the uh, canopy or the understory area of the rainforest. He would live down below the very, very tippy tops of the trees. And that works out great for him because Leo is an animal that loves his fruits. Some of his favorite fruits at the zoo are things like bananas. He's got some grapes here today. But in the rainforest, he would be able to find those fruits in the lower parts of the uh, tops of the trees. So he would love to hang out there. It's where he feels nice and safe. But Leo doesn't really have a problem staying. Um, really, you're feeling ever endangered because he has all of these quills on his back that keep him super safe. So porcupines, everyone knows, are very, very sharp. So Leo does have some very sharp quills on his back. But the thing about quills is that they're really just hairs, and they behave just like any hair would. When he gets uh, scared or mad, just like with humans, cats, and dogs, his hair will kind of stand up. His quills will all stand up. He, gets, he looks big, he looks sharp, he looks pokey, and animals don't wanna, really don't want to mess with him much. So those quills do a great job of keeping him safe, but when they're laid down, they're really nothing, nothing to be afraid of. But if you're an animal he doesn't like, or somebody he doesn't like, or you're not doing something he... I uh, want you to be doing, then those quills can come in to be quite a problem. So you can see Leo here munching on bananas. Um, he's got a pretty interesting mouth too. Uh, Leo is actually a rodent, and that means he's related to things like mice, rats, beavers. And the thing about that is his big teeth. He's got those big front teeth like we think about with mice and rats and beavers. And the thing about those teeth is that they never, ever stop growing. They'll keep growing and keep growing and keep growing uh, his entire life. He has to make sure that those teeth don't get too big. If his teeth get too big, he can't close his mouth right. He can't uh, open it wide enough to get certain foods that he wants. So he has to be really careful with those teeth. And the way that he keeps his teeth uh, in a good, healthy shape and size is with chewing. He loves to chew. He chews on wood all day long. Uh, and at the zoo, he also gets some special different foods um, like rodent block and monkey biscuits that are really, really tough foods that are kind of like vitamins for him. They give him all of the um, vitamins, minerals, and nutrients he needs that we don't have those tropical fruits for him um, that you find in the rainforest. But these monkey biscuits and these rodent blocks give him good, healthy things to chew on to keep his teeth from getting too big. And he also always has wood. Um, so he's always kind of... Uh, able to find things to chew on and he loves to chew. Now one of the really fun things about Leo is kind of how he came here. Um, Leo is originally from the Bronx Zoo in New York so he's traveled quite a ways and he actually came to Blank Park Zoo to be part of a uh, breeding program. So um, prehensile tailed porcupines are a little endangered so that we try to breed them in zoos to make sure that we have lots of porcupines available for um, projects like when the rainforests kind of get um, reconstructed and some of those problems get tapered down a little bit. We'll have this healthy population of porcupines in zoos that we can then reintroduce into the rainforest. So Leo has been doing a fantastic job. He's got children and grandchildren all over uh, the United States in different zoos doing a lot of really good things for all prehensile tail porcupines just like him. Now, Leo's got a lot of kids and a lot of grandkids, but he is only 12 years old. Now, he can live to be into his 20s, so he's still probably got a while left on him. Um, 
but he's accomplished a lot in those, those, those 12 short years that he's been around. And you can't really talk about um, Leo or animals in general without talking about their personalities. We always think about personalities with things like cats and dogs, but Leo has got a fantastic personality. I know Kaylee loves his personality. He is always so curious. He's always around, always exploring, um, and he loves his food. He loves people because people are the ones who give him his food. So uh, he's super social and super fun to be around. Uh, however, he stinks. He does smell very, very, very bad, but that's kind of just how porcupines are. Um, in the wild, he has those strong smells because he wants to be able to communicate with other porcupines so they know where he is because you can smell him from a long ways away. But that also helps him stay safe from other animals that would want to try to eat him because nobody wants to eat stinky things. Humans don't want to eat stinky food. Most animals don't want to eat stinky food. So if Leo smells very, very bad, Things are just going to leave him alone. So we've talked lots about porcupines, but Leo is a little different. He's a special kind, and I said that he's a prehensile tail porcupine, which means that his tail is kind of like, uh, almost like another hand. He can bend his tail and grab things with his tail. So when he's sitting on branches eating with his hands, like you see him doing now, he can wrap his tail around that branch to help him hold on to the branch so he doesn't uh, fall out, he doesn't have to worry about anything because that tail is so strong and so good at hanging. And, I mean, it's helpful for when he eats, but just getting around the rainforest. The trees are so thick and so dense, there's so many vines, that he has to be able to maneuver his way through all of those and so he can get and reach anywhere he needs to go, and that tail is just always a little backup. So he can grab things, hold on to stuff, um, and really kind of keep himself as safe as he needs to be. So Leo is a pretty uh, a pretty fun porcupine to have around. All right, everybody, this is Amboro, and he is a blue and gold macaw. Can you wave? Good. So if Amboro were to live in the wild, he would live in the upper areas of the rainforest, that being the canopy and the emergent area. So the canopy is the second highest part of the rainforest, and that would be where you would find a lot of your um, brushier areas, a lot of vegetation, it's very thick and full. So there are quite a few animals that actually live there. So iguanas and bugs and birds of all sorts would actually live in that area. And Amboro would be one of those animals that would spend a lot of time there as well, just to kind of hide from predators and hide in his uh, flock of other parrots as well. Now the emergent area is the very top of the rainforest. That would be where the sun hits the most. And Amboro would fly with his flock up into the emergent area and spend a lot of time basking in the sun and relaxing because there's not a ton of animals that actually spend time up there. So more of your birds and bugs would be in that emergent area. So a little bit about Amboro. Um, he came to us quite a while ago. So Amboro right now is about 26 years old. Um, parrots can live a very long time. Blue and gold parrots can actually live up into their 80s. So Amboro is a young parrot, and he has quite a bit longer to um, live with us at Blank Park Zoo. Now, parrots are, uh, macaws specifically, are talking parrots. So that means that they can say words and mimic things. Now, they don't really know what they're saying, um, but they do learn over time to make those noises. Because in the wild, when they're mimicking, they wouldn't mimic people. They would mimic other animals and predators in the wild too. Because if they had something come a little too close to them, they could give a call like a um, leopard or a jaguar, and maybe that would steer another predator away that might be a little bit smaller. So we'll see if Amboro wants to say something to us today. Can you, are you a pirate? Ah. Good. We'll let him finish his food and then we'll ask him one more thing. Name. Can you laugh? Good. All right. So that brings us to one other thing that we like to talk about when we talk about our animals at the zoo. Is yes, we do train them and that is what we were doing right there. Um, we use positive reinforcement training and when an animal doesn't do something that we ask during positive reinforcement training, we just don't do anything at all. So they don't get rewarded for that behavior or anything like that, but when they do do something we want, then they get rewarded for it. So macaws out in the wild, um, they have a really important diet of a lot of vegetation and fruits because they would live in the rainforest and that's kind of what grows there. Um, right now I'm giving him some pellets that are called like parrot pellets or bird pellets and they're just kind of round and have a lot of nutrients for him. 
Um, and then he would also, ah. in the wild, need something called salt licks. Ah. So ah. there are natural salt ah. licks in the rainforest that a lot of animals venture to to make sure that they're getting that mineral um, substituted in their diet. So he would be looking on like clay and holes in the ground that have kind of some running water that's a little lighter so he can get that salt mineral. Now his pellets actually have all those salts in there for him so we don't have to worry about that at the zoo to have a salt lick for him here. But we do have things to mimic his environment and the rainforest in his enclosure. So his enclosure is large. Um, these, this size of bird needs a lot of space so that they can stay comfortable and make sure that they're staying healthy. So we make sure that room is filled with a bunch of branches, just kind of like that canopy area in the rainforest. So we fill it with a bunch of branches so he has places to perch, just like this perch he has here. Now, wow. a parrot's foot when they perch is very important. They have two toes in the front and two toes in the back, and we call that zygodactyl. And that allows them to grip onto their perching and lock on. Now, they actually have tendons in their foot as well that help wow. them to hold onto a branch when they're sleeping. So all a parrot has to do when it's ready to take a nap is sit down. And once it sits down, those tendons lock in and they make sure he stays secured. Now all he has to do to stand back up and fly off again is to stand up. So he just has to sit up and those tendons unlock and he is good to go and fly through the rest of the canopy um, in the rainforest. Thanks so much for joining us today, guys. We really appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed it. Now that you've learned so much, tell us what you can find in the rainforest today. Thanks so much. See you later.